Thank you very much. Uh, I wish to thank the SLMA for giving me this opportunity to make this presentation today. Um, I must say at the beginning that I feel that I'm a complete fraud to be speaking on this topic because thinking of role models, I think the SLMA has enough senior members who have aged wisely and there is certainly so much to learn from them and I am perhaps the least qualified to do that. I must say that my previous speaker, Professor Dianath himself, may have prog progressed in age but doesn't seem to have aged. He remains the same for the last 20 years or so that I have known him. And I dare say, is still perhaps the most eligible bachelor. As far as I know, he's never been formally married. Um, but talking of life as well, and listening to him and his last few slides and words, uh, I'm intrigued to know whether he has ever thought of how life is without a wife. And I'm not sure <laughs> whether I should envy him or he should envy me. <laughs> but again, that's something to ponder about. I'm sure he has something to say to that. He says to those of you who wouldn't have heard him that he believes in experimenting and finding out and rightfully he has apparently experimented it himself. Well, let's leave it at that and continue moving forward. Thank you, sir, for waiting to hear me say those words. So aptly, I'm going to start with what we call the rat race. And I think the previous two speakers too spoke basically on this concept. Dr. Dulangi was trying to tell us how we can be part of the rat race and still be good parents and do good parenting. And I think Prof. Dienath was challenging us to come out of this rat race. But for most of us in Asian societies, the rat race is the reality of life. Now, take a moment and think of a rat race. In this rat race, you're running with other rats. So you're not running alone. You're running because the senior rat in front of you is also running and you're just following their pathway. They seem to have or seem to know where they are going. So we just run after them. And once you start this rat race, remember you cannot stop because if you suddenly stop, the rats, there are rats running behind you and they will come and jump on you and trample you and you will become chopified and injured in this journey. So once we get into the rat race, we can't. We, don't, we can't say, no, I'm a little bit tired. I'm going to come out and wait for a while because you never know. There may be somebody coming behind with a broom and I may get attacked if I stand alone, stand outside the rat race. We seem very vulnerable. So it's always good to be part of this crowd and keep running. So from our childhood, we are running, we ran to school, we ran to, they told us that the O-level was the biggest thing to achieve, we passed the O-level, and then they told us, no, now do the A-level, and that's the biggest thing to achieve, and then you get into A-level, then they say, you know, you become a doctor, then that's the greatest thing, and then you can finish the red race, you become a doctor, and then... Once you become a doctor, they say, ah, okay, now you have got to do your internship. You have got to do your post-intern appointments. You have to go to the corona unit. You have to do so many things. So you're still running. 
and then they say you can't you know basically run alone you have to run with somebody and they get you married off and then they say once you get married you know you need to think of having children so you have your first child and then they say one child is not enough you need to have another child to run with this child so you end up with two children and then you have the others telling you now having children is not enough you need to find schools for them and you need to get a house close to the school because then only you can put them in so you start running either to the old boys association or the old girls association as well as finding a land and building a house and then afterwards when you finish that you start running with the children to school to tuition class to what not then getting them into university and beyond and then after that they get married and then they have children and then you are running after your grandchildren so there is very little time for us like prof dianath said to stop and think because this is the journey that all of us take and in between we try to you know see where we can find happiness but when it comes to all of us one day the race is over and we have to suddenly wake up children have grown up they have gone out the grandchildren are also perhaps out there and don't need you anymore and you have now retired no more of the slma or pgim commitments and then what do i know do the race is over so this is what or oh, this is when we start aging now age as i said is merely a numerical number it is not an indicator of a person's physical or mental health it is not an indicator of aging aging is a mental state and perhaps a physical state too that leads from this mental state so i find or uh, many of us find people who in their 50s itself sometimes are patients if it's sad you know say that they are now old and have given up on life and api mukada sir then api vaisai and then we see people in their 80s who want to go around the world and do many other things so again age is just a numerical number you don't you age when you think you are aging and aging is as i say again a state of mind and that determines how well we live life so in a, in a sense retiring at 55 is too early but we find people coming and asking us for medical certificates even before they are 55 wanting premature retirement and in today's context almost all of us will live till 80 years in sri lanka because life expectancy at birth is 76 to 78 and if we have survived till 30 40 50 years we are going to definitely live beyond 80 years so retiring at 55 is really too early so even at 65 i think maybe you retire from your other responsibilities but i don't think you retire in terms of what you can contribute to wider society when you are a doctor so this is something we need to keep in mind but life does bring changes as we progress in age and this is about sigmund freud who is credited with being a neurologist who first made forays into the mind and discovered uh, certain uh, concepts so when he was young it was different for him and when he was not so young you see his partner is somebody else who's perhaps making him think a little more about uh, various things so in this talk today i will because i am not qualified to talk about aging from my experience like prof diana i can but only focus on the scientific aspects of aging and how we can deal with some of the issues that perhaps stop us living fruitfully in our older years or senior years so depressive disorder 
is the most frequent psychiatric disorder of older people. And it has a negative impact on the quality of life. And it also worsens the impact of the physical disability that we experience. And many of us may not realize that even in terms of suicide, even in Sri Lanka, we have two peaks. We have a peak between 18 to 25, 28 years, the young group. But we have a second peak after 65. And we don't see this group of people because when they do commit suicide, they do it successfully and they don't come to hospitals. And this peak is also shown in our statistical framework where unfortunately many old people do die of suicide. And apart from suicide, even in terms of mortality, depression is an independent predictor of earlier death. And this is something we need to consider. So up to 15%, maybe 13 to 15% of older people suffer from depression. And again, it will depend on, on the circumstances of the people. And uh, particularly when it comes to people in hospitals and nursing homes, the group that we see most of the time, depressive disorder is much higher. And those with chronic medical disorders, including heart disease, obstructive pulmonary disease and even diabetes and so on have higher rates of depression. So the question is, is it preventable? How do we stop depression or how do we try to overcome depression? The modifier risk factors are both physical as well as psychosocial. So old age depression, now we understand has a significant organic component. In MRI, you would see white matter demyelination and oftentimes we consider it to be a vascular depression due to vascular insufficiency to the brain. It's comorbid with conditions like Alzheimer's disease and there's certainly a higher prevalence, prevalence post-stroke and in Parkinson's disease. And as I mentioned before, it's common in association with other chronic dis medical disorders or metabolic disorders like diabetes, which affect vascular integrity. So preventing vascular risk factors, the NCD prevention uh, paradigm does definitely help us prevent depression as well in old age. So preventing or treating hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and metabolic syndrome. Also making sure that we lead healthy lives, reduce homocysteine, have adequate B12 supplementation or the necessary vitamins and minerals, and diet lifestyle modification can certainly prevent us from developing depressive disorder. These are the well-known associations with depression, both hyper and hyperthyroidism. We need to treat them aggressively. Conditions like Cushing's, hypercalcemia, pernicious anemia, folic acid deficiency, SLE, and any other, uh, even chronic kidney disease, which is not mentioned here, but is a significant cause of depression has to be noted down. And when we age, we also take multiple drugs and we are prescribed many drugs, which by themselves do sometimes contribute to the depression that we have. Some of the antihypertensives, particularly beta blockers, thankfully we don't use methyl dopa so much now, but calcium channel blockers and even digoxin can play a role in uh, depression 
in older people. And we need to sort of review these medicines and see whether there are other alternatives when, you, when we see people who are getting depressed. So obviously opioids, even COX-2 inhibitors, when they are used long-term, corticosteroid use, and sometimes some of the anti-Parkinsonian drugs that are prescribed too can contribute to depressive disorder. Now there are also psychosocial factors, factors that we need to focus on more as we progress in age. And I think uh, Professor Pianjali will probably speak on some of the ways we can help ourselves mindfully. But leading active life, I think, is an important uh, aspect of aging. And I think the older we become, the more determined we should be to get into an exercise regime, to keep ourselves active physically, but also mentally. So all the more reasons we, we attend, all the more reason we attend um, CPD activities, we participate in lectures, we even try to do various activities like reading and writing, and even maybe doing postgraduate studies, maybe just doing something even in your older years, to keep your mind ticking. And that is very important. So you need to be part of committees. You need to be continuing to contribute to Sri Lanka Medical Association, even as you progress in age, so that you will not age as time goes by. And take on other meaningful roles as well. You need to start playing with your grandchildren, do things that you never did before, like maybe learning to play a musical instrument, maybe taking up some religious activities, trying something new, painting or playing and doing various games with your children. All these things will help you stay young. And also fostering resilience, because as you grow older, Life brings with it many losses. So it's not just the loss of your role in society, the role as a doctor sometimes, and as a teacher, but also sometimes when you progress in age, you lose people close to you, your friends sometimes, sometimes it's your spouse, and sometimes it's even your own children. And these can be very traumatic. So you need to be resilient. You need to be ready to face these losses. If you are dependent on external circumstances and don't brace yourself or prepare yourself to sometimes go on this journey alone, when you age, you are going to be very vulnerable in your journey. Now, handicap which is the social disadvantage caused by illness is closely associated with depression. So the more we get ourselves into circumstances where we cannot go about, and I know even the corona situation has placed many people at a social disadvantage, particularly when they are older. So obviously they are reluctant or anxious to go out. And the more they keep to the house, you will see, and this is my experience too, that over the past year, many older people have aged beyond their years just because they have been confined to the house. So this is a, another situation and I encourage every old person I see to some or other go for walks and even if they meet the police to tell them that the doctor has prescribed this walk and that as long as they keep themselves safe and not get into any crowd, that they walk on some quiet road to keep themselves active. So you need to have a routine where perhaps you do active things and have a plan even during lockdown to engage. And I think social media does help in many ways in maybe having Zoom catch-ups or Zoom meetings where you would even touch base uh, with your old friends and link up and do things together. And there are innovative ways I know that many people use. I know uh, a 
a few people who, you know, although they are in various parts of the world, they catch up on Zoom and they make themselves a nice drink or something which they can have and they share it while they have this chat and have a time of chatting regularly where they do different things on their own and share what they have done or have even a reading a book club through which they could share their ideas and these are but ways to keep your mind stimulated and active so when i spoke of a drink i didn't mean or i didn't talk about or i didn't intend to suggest an alcohol alcoholic drink because obviously alcohol is another dangerous thing in old age and when you're lonely if you start using it you will perhaps become more depressed and in more dire circumstances and this is something you need to actively avoid in your older years the current evidence clearly shows that even a little amount of alcohol is harmful for your brain health earlier we used to talk of a j curve where maybe a drink was better than not having a drink but current evidence clearly shows in some of the meta analysis and the large studies they have done that your amount of alcohol is directly proportional to the degree of brain atrophy that you get so it's definitely linked directly to the impairment of the connections in the brain now interestingly in sri lanka uh, we have a legal requirement uh, through the elders uh, legislation which requires that younger people or children look after their older parents and not just prevent abuse but also look into their well being and make sure that they have the correct support to remain both active and healthy during this period of lockdown and beyond now there are some common myths and that is that depression is a normal part of aging when i look back at some of my aunts and uncles when i was young you know that was the sort of common thing and i know some of them were quite depressed when we used to visit them but we took it as a part of normal aging and never took them to anybody to be helped or treated now among doctors the common myth is that if you are smart emotionally and uh, you are strong you won't get depressed and this is a sad thing because i see a lot of uh, sometimes older doctors going through depression and when they take take appropriate treatment and bounce back and get back into their normal routine it's a pleasure to see them recovering and i realize that there may be others who may be reluctant to seek help because in their younger days they have been very strong and healthy and they just cannot come to terms with the fact that certain organic illnesses and other situations may be now getting them depressed and people think that depression is because because the way we think and we cannot wait change the way we think and these are things that we can change even in our old age and we can become more positive people who can live more positively despite any deficiencies or illnesses we have i would just touch briefly on the psychological self help that is sort of evidence proven i think professor p angel will speak on uh, certain practical things you can do but this is the cognitive behavior therapy model which to say we look at thoughts and behavior and we believe that behave modifying our thoughts and changing our behaviors can improve both our feelings as well as our physical health so if i am thinking negatively and thinking that you know there's nothing for me to live then i don't do the things i would be doing before my behavior also is 
not so positive. I don't attend the SLMA meetings. I don't attend the webinars. I keep at home and I think I don't have much to contribute. So then you feel even more lower in mood and you feel very tired and weak physically. But if you get up in the morning and even if you don't think positively, you tell yourself, look, I'm going to join this webinar. I'm going to participate in this meeting and I'm going to see how I can contribute. Then you do this behavior, even if you don't think positively, when you participate in it, at the end of it, sometimes you have contributed something and you have made a comment which you thought was useful. And you feel much positive and you realize that your thoughts now become more positive. Certain behaviors, certain activities make you feel better. You feel that you're too tired. You don't want to meet up with your friends, but joining a group and talking to them makes you feel better at the end of the day so that in the night you feel much more positive about the day that you have had and that will make you feel better. So improving your behavior, even if you don't improve your thoughts is so much um, beneficial to uh, bring about the necessary change in your feelings and even your thoughts. If you find that your thoughts are troubling you, then try doing positive things and that will change your thoughts in a positive direction. So remember that many of the persons affected with depression in older age, particularly in Sri Lanka, uh, wouldn't come out and say that they have sadness or they are feeling depressed. They would come out with physical complaints. So they will start worrying that they may be having a cancer repeatedly seeking help from doctors. They may even worry that they are losing their memory, which we call depressive pseudo-dementia. And uh, they may become very anxious, sometimes very fearful about going out, becoming a bit obsessive, checking all the time and catastrophizing their minor symptoms and worrying too much and also may lose interest and motivation in doing some of the things they do. So these may be the predominant signs of depression in later life. And they may not present with the typical symptoms that we see in younger persons when they have depressive disorders. So in, treat, in terms of treatment, remember there are effective treatments you need to identify early and that's very important even in our day-to-day -day practice, whether it, be, whether it is something in ourselves, our parents, or even the people we see, we need to identify early and treat vigorously, but cautiously, not overload with antidepressants. Many older people will not tolerate them very well. You need to start with very low doses, gradually titrate it up, and may have to wait a bit longer may take three weeks to six weeks or even up to two months for an older person to recover. It's about being patient, encouraging them and gradually increasing the antidepressant till you see the recovery that you expect. And you may have to consider longer term maintenance, not stop the antidepressant as soon as the person recovers, but to continue it perhaps for even two to three years or even longer if necessary, because what we are looking at is quality of life. It's not about uh, just doing something temporary when the person um, is active and more energetic, it's going to help them have a better quality of life in the longer term. So with the aging of Sri Lanka, as you know, uh, the percentage of the elderly population in Sri Lanka is increasing and soon uh, every fifth person in Sri Lanka will be over the age of 60 years. We need to think of supporting older people to live meaningful lives. So it's something that we cannot just confine to doctors alone, but even have supportive communities and community systems that support older people who are progressing in age. And I think this is a care model that we need to think of. You need to support the senior and always 
sometimes the Chiara, the daughter or the son or whoever is living with them because they find it stressful when they come home and find their parent complaining. They need to be in a positive frame to support their older parents when they get depressed. They need to understand that they may be depressed and may need more support. And in such a situation, I think every family practitioner or the GP has to be equipped to identify and treat older persons when they are depressed. And as and when necessary, perhaps get the help of the psychiatrist or the geriatrician. But we may also have to, in terms of our community model, think of an NCD nurse, perhaps supporting people and also identifying older persons with depression and supporting them. And similarly, the social services, NGOs and care homes also need to concentrate more on not just maintaining older people in their care homes, but about giving them a quality life where they can age meaningfully. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shahan. That uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, actually, uh, we are in a country that there are about now 15% of uh, people are above uh, uh, 60 years of age. And uh, we, the and our reference actually is COVID and aging, and uh, with reference to vaccination, you saw that that uh, how our community uh, behave uh, when there is so much of data that the more than 60 has to be given priority for vaccination. So in that type of a setting, what is your message for uh, people less than 60 years of age? So you raised this whole issue of ageism, madam. The thing is, uh, in today's context, a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, don't realize the important aspect uh, of treating our older people uh, in terms of the scientific evidence we have. And we know that even in relation to morbidity and mortality, in COVID, the highest, uh, the biggest problem is in our older people. And uh, most people who die of COVID are over the age of 70 years. So obviously we need to make sure that we protect them. And it's only rational as a human society that we prioritize, like in most developed countries, the older people and make sure that they are vaccinated first. And I think the younger people need to realize this uh, all the more um, sooner and uh, make sure that we bring the older people for vaccination and give them that opportunity. In fact, even in most homes, the sad fact is a lot of people don't realize it. They say, my mother is too old now for vaccination or now she's too ill, should we get her vaccinated? She has dementia and so on. Those people are the very people who should be vaccinated because every fifth person who dies of dementia or dies of COVID has dementia. And if we are a human society, we need to make sure that we reduce the number of deaths related to COVID. And the only way to reduce even the blockage in the ICUs and the uh, burden on the health service is by uh, vaccinating our older people. And I hope <laughs> some sanity will prevail in this regard, madam, as we have recommended in the SLMA. Shahan, there is a question here. Fairly long. Uh, culturally, we were a society and still it is to some extent which respected and looked after the elderly. This has changed mainly with economic and social disadvantages mainly. Looking after the members of the society is the obligation of the government and provision of the social insurance, not only free health, is the responsibility of the government. Didn't this law, Protection of the Rights of the Elders Act, transfer its costly responsibility to the general public of the country? 
this is a law that supports the current economic system of free market then the elderly of the country what are your thoughts sir? <laughs> i must say that's a very good uh, question uh, it's something that's debated a lot because in western societies uh, it is the responsibility of the government but because of our culture as rightly mentioned it is the children who have looked after their parents traditionally and the current law reinforces that and in a situation where the government hasn't stepped forward i think at least in the interim interim as we progress i think that is a very reasonable law because society is in transition and now because both children are working and there is not just external migration but even internal migration a lot of older people are left at home when the families are smaller and the the isolation of the older person is becoming uh, more pronounced and in such a situation uh, particularly in the middle class and higher levels of society which really has the resources uh, we find that those are the communities that really doesn't sometimes look after the older person whereas the the lower strata the people who don't have the resources will some or other look after their older people most of the time and unfortunately it's people with resources who don't do it and uh, sadly the higher the socio economic status sometimes you find the children fighting for the resources of their parents and giving them step motherly treatment or not even looking into their needs and more being more interested in dividing the assets that they have and this is sometimes the reality so in such circumstances i think at least in the interim this law does provide some safeguards although i do agree it's not the ideal and at some point the government too should make an effort to support uh, and as a health sector i think we also need to make that initial justification to uh, support the older adults more and this is particularly the point i think uh, dr padma gunaratna was saying is that um, even in terms of vaccination we are unable to make this point at least give it to the older people and the public too and even among the medics some of us do not agree on this and that is a sad reality we are if it's a government responsibility the first government responsibility is to vaccinate them above uh, the other age groups and give them that priority and that is at least a start that will make us advocate more in the future for more government responsibility and input in looking after older adults i have a general question uh, not about the vaccination program now uh, you said uh, depression is common in elderly and like uh, it, it, the mental health issues are common after retirement so what is the role of you know planning the retirement when you are early do you, does it have a have an impact a big role yes i think it certainly does this is the thing but unfortunately as doctors we don't plan because we go on and on and on <laughs> till we <laughs> are naturally or forced out of what we do but for an average person um, planning a retirement is very important and we have to accept our limitations and think of various things to do and uh, have accept the natural progression as well and plan accordingly and appropriately and be ready for the changes that will come because when it happens suddenly then it can be a real blow to many of us so thankfully many doctors do continue late into life but i find that there are times when this whole question of even competence comes into comes into place and that is where sometimes we don't have insight into ourselves to realize that we have to stop at some point the practice of medicine because we may not be 
uh, up to date or not be providing the service that is expected to us because of our limitations. Thanks, uh, Shihan. Thank you very much for that. Valuable comments. I mean that that becomes more important, more important in particular in the case of surgeons, I think, isn't it? That, uh, I mean, maybe that uh, there has to be sort of a regular uh, reviewing of the license thing uh, for that type of a thing also maybe applicable. So thank you very much for that ex excellent or uh, provoking uh, presentation on uh, aging wisely. Uh, and thank you very much for the contribution that you made for the pre-Congress uh, uh, session. Thank you. Now I invite Madam President to hand over the certificate to Professor Shehan Williams. <laughs>